The world of literature prepares for the moment of truth. The Booker Prize live from London's Guildhall on BBC Two in 10 minutes. Before that, how a change of heart is putting the colour back into concrete. These are stirring times for concrete. After years of being despised and in disgrace, concrete is at last being re-relished for its full and glorious potential. It has been a long haul from the structural splendors of ancient Rome, where there are a surprising quantity of concrete buildings, to its rebirth of today. But architects are now realizing what could and should be built with this brilliantly versatile material. Concrete was reborn in Britain in the early 1800s when Joseph Aspin invented his superior Portland cement. Stones, sand, cement and water being the four ingredients that make up the rock cake that is concrete. So successful was Aspin cement that his son was to open the largest cement works in the world at Gateshead. They were palatial premises, proudly proclaiming the importance of cement, with the giant figure of Hercules over all, struggling in vain to separate bricks bonded with the stuff. The cement itself, packed into barrels, lies waiting to be shipped off down the Tyne. The North Kent coast, where a consignment of cement from Aspin's Kent works ran aground at Rats Bay in 1848. The ship, by a twist of fate called the Lucky Escape, was said to have been pillaged by wreckers at Sheppey, who thought that the barrels were full of whisky. When they found only cement in the barrels, the looters put them to excellent use, building this pub, the ship on shore. In Victorian Britain, concrete was dammed every bit as much as it was desired. As early as the 1860s and 70s, controversy was raging as to whether or not it should appear naked in its undecorated state, or whether it should be disguised with old and familiar fig leaves. Here at last, wrote one critic, is a real chance of doing something new with a new material and method. All this dressing up of the new in an old cloak is labour thrown away in making a sham. Incidentally, one critic wrote of the cleanliness of concrete in having no hollow spaces in which to harbour vermin. The sham could be enticingly intricate, like these details all cast in concrete, on the exterior of the Grosvenor Hotel at Victoria in London. What was to be done? If dolling up concrete was deemed to be a disaster of duplicity, then what should it look like? In its sheer and unadorned state, it was the very antithesis of the architectural exuberance of the Victorian age. In 1883, the architect Frederick Pepys Cockrell triumphantly trod the tightrope between the two factions at Down Hall in Essex, a stylish, stately home of concrete, now a hotel, with decorations that, far from betraying the material, brings it out in glorious relief. To achieve this effect, called scrafito, panels of cement were scratched through to reveal the concrete beneath. While Down Hall attempted to solve the decorative dilemma, at Sway in Hampshire the structural potential of the material was realised to the full when it was stretched 218 feet into the sky. This tower was built between 1879 and 1885 in the Indo-Gothic style by Andrew Thomas Turton Peterson, a one-time High Court judge of Calcutta. Judge Peterson was touched by spiritualism during his many years in India, and this interest was rekindled in England by an alarming group called the New Forest Shakers. The design for his great Indian tower he always claimed was guided by the spirit of Sir Christopher Wren, who urged him ever on to build in his favourite material, concrete. 
that Wren might have been interested in the material is in fact not quite as far-fetched as it seems. He had always claimed that his inspiration for the Dome of St. Paul's had been the Dome of the Pantheon in Rome, which was built in concrete in 127 AD. Peterson's celestial messages from Sir Christopher Wren, imagined or not, gave him the grit and the gumption without any experience of building to design this great Indian tower, in its day the tallest concrete building in the world. In the 1920s and 30s, architects were entranced by concrete. They saw it as the quintessential modern material and in an echo of the earlier Victorian debate, building with it, in all its unadorned honesty, became their moral crusade. Here you see the shortcomings of that crusade. The way the concrete is used may be honest, but the effect is brutal. These wartime forts on the Isle of Sheppey grimly presage the post-war tower blocks. Now the tide has turned again. This used to be Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge, it is being rebuilt as a business college to designs by the architect John Outram. His dashingly up-to-the-minute development of the 19th century facade is giving concrete a vigorously new and colourful life. Between the wars, there was a prohibition on ornament. You couldn't have a serious architecture with ornament. And the result was these large plain surfaces of concrete which weathered very badly. What we have done is to, on the one hand, say that in fact you can be serious about ornament and on the other to introduce techniques of patterning concrete so that we, we cast brick into concrete and brick never loses its colour and we also inlay concrete in, in two colours and the effect of this is to make the pattern stronger than the weathering. So what we've created now is a material that I call synthetic masonry. It can be any colour, any pattern, any shape. And that's a really modern, that's a really modern material. Meanwhile, in these new buildings for St John's College, Oxford, the architect Richard McCormack has resurrected the ideals of Rome, whilst at the same time trumpeting out the technology of our times. I doubt if a contemporary concrete building has ever been emblazoned with such a rich and varied mix of surfaces. very very solid and the interiors are like great caverns and the upper parts of the building are very delicate and light so the concrete changes broadly speaking as it goes upwards it starts very heavily uh, point tool to use the technical expression it's been attacked with a jackhammer and then the textures go through a range from that very heavy point tooling through what we call needle gunning and the polishing, which produces a very smooth surface, very much like marble. Concrete is too important a material to be uh, hidden away or kind of uh, be camouflaged for artistic reasons. We've got to find the language of the material again and use it boldly. So not before time, it's a big kiss for concrete. <laughs> to do if your neighbour had an accident? And do you think you can look after yourself? In a week dedicated to talking health, your BBC local radio station will ask the questions and help find you the answers. What are the chances of getting an appointment at your local hospital? Is the air safe to breathe in your street? And do you know how to get fit for the life you want to live? If you care about these issues, call free phone 0800 888806 for more information about Talking Health Week on your BBC local radio station.
New talent, fresh drama. From the imagination of writer Ian Banks comes The Crow Road. Welcome to the world of Prentice McCohen. Don't start the commission! I think Grandma just exploded. That is some funeral kit. Even black knickers. A search for answers. Where's Rory going? Rory's not dead. He's so full of life, then where the hell is he? A search for self. It's one of life's trials to have a brother who's more talented and better looking than you. You want a lift? If I changed it, you dad. I know, Prem. Come on. Starring Peter Capaldi, Bill Patterson and Joseph McFadden. You saw the woman you love wrap herself around your richer, wetter and better looking brother? God, no. A compelling story about life and love. The Crow Road, Monday, 9.30, BBC Two. One woman struggled to free her parents from Nazi oppression, the concluding part of BBC Two's powerful film drama in 50 minutes.